Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. I was an indifferent student. I wasn't poor. I had a B grade point average, but I just didn't like school. So college wasn't in my future. I've never been further than 70 kilometers from the city where I was born. So one of the things I wanted to do was travel. Traveling meant money, and money meant a good job that paid well. And although there may have been many jobs in our city, none of them paid well enough for me to do what I wanted to do. The day after graduation, with my diploma in hand, I was waiting at the entrance to the Army Enlistment Office when the recruiter unlocked the door. I filled out a bunch of questionnaires, and when they asked me what I would like to do, I pointed out airborne troops, infantry, armored vehicles, and, finally, artillery. Three days later, I was on a bus heading to Fort Knox, Kentucky, for basic training. After basic, the Army reviewed my list of options and decided that I didn't really need any of these. So the next thing on my travel itinerary was a trip to Fort Lee, Virginia, where I learned the basics of Army supplies. I learned how to assemble crates, pack supplies, and operate forklifts that loaded cargo into trucks and railroad cars to get it to where it was needed. At the end of the course, I was given a list of places where my military specialty was required and asked to mark my preferences in the order in which I would like to enroll. I chose the UK, two places, Germany, three places, France, one place, Spain, one place, Italy, two places, and Hawaii. Naturally, an army is an army. They looked at my choice and decided that I really didn't mean it when I made this choice, and they sent me to Korea. For the next 16 months, I worked as a supply clerk at the 55th Quartermaster Warehouse in Busan, Korea. This included a six-week TDY, temporary duty assignment, in Yokohama, Japan, and a three-week TDY in Seoul. The next stage of my round-the-world trip was a 12-month assignment to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I was supposed to be when my enlistment period expired. Two months before the end of my military service, I was not surprised when the first sergeant called me into his office and tried to gently persuade me to think about the Army as a career. I honestly told him that I didn't really think I wanted to do this, and he asked me why. I told him a chapter and a verse about how I ended up in the reserve, instead of the choice I made when I enlisted, and in Korea, when I chose the other side of the world, when I was given a list to choose from. I told him that the army just didn't seem to care about what concerned me. Besides, I can't imagine how I'm going to pack and transport boxes in the next 20 years. I think I understand how you look at it, but you have to understand that the army has to send people where they are needed. They needed people for supplies and they thought you could handle the job, so they sent you there. It's the same with the distribution of responsibilities. They put you where they think you will be best suited. We need to supply more than packaging materials and loading machines. Someone has to manage the warehouses. Someone has to plan the movement of materials, keep an eye on stocks, order what is needed, and make sure that it is delivered in a timely manner to where it is needed. Someone has to lead the people. The list can go on and on. You became a corporal in two years, and most of them, if they become corporals at all, get promoted only towards the end of their service, so the authorities obviously think that you have everything you need. If you sign up now, I can guarantee you a place in the next supply management class, and by the end of the course you should be enrolled in E5. This man could sell sand to an Arab, and after another half-hour conversation, Uncle Sam took me in for another three years. The first sergeant tried his best to get me to take six, but I was just a little incredulous. He made a few promises, but I've already seen that as soon as you put your signature on the dotted line, the army does what it wants. I would just wait and see what happens before committing myself to a 20-year career. Sergeant Ebers was honest with me. I was assigned to an eight-month supply management course at Fort Lee, and after a 30-day vacation I reported. The course was not difficult, and I easily passed it and finished in the top five in a class of 32 people. The next stage of my world tour was a 12-month assignment at Fort Hood, Texas, and six months after my stay there, I was promoted to E5, Staff Sergeant. Then I was sent to Stuttgart Morgen in Germany for a year, and during my vacations I was able to visit England, France, and Spain. Then we returned to the USA for an excursion to Fort Leonard Wood. And again, two months after the end of my enlistment, I was in the office of the first sergeant where he did everything possible to convince me that my future was connected with the green machine. But he lost the battle because this time I did not buy it. 
I had six years to discover one of the basic army truths, and it was that most officers with the rank of major and below, with the exception of 90% of West Pointers, were inadequate, screaming jerks, or both at the same time. Idiots from the Quartermaster Corporation. I firmly believe that supply was a dumping ground for officers who couldn't cut it in other units. I've seen dozens of my fellow infantrymen go to Article 15 chicken shit hearings and military tribunals, usually because some brainless officer screwed up and blamed the nearest private. I watched as guys whose only crime was being in the wrong place at the wrong time while serving under an incompetent clown were sent to jail for a period of 90 days to a year. It's been over a year, and you've received a paid trip to Leavenworth. I knew it was only a matter of time before it happened to me. I told my superiors, thank you, but no, please. For the past two months, I've been called to the first sergeant's office once a week for an advertising campaign. He even promised me an E6 for six months, which I resisted, and then I got fired and went home. I spent the first two weeks reacquainting myself with people I knew and looking for an apartment. As soon as I got a job, I went to look for a job. Surprisingly, I was hired by the first company I applied to. It so happened that XYZ Industries just needed a person in their delivery and reception department, and one look at my army experience gave me this job. I went to school with two guys who worked in the shipping industry, so I wasn't an outsider when I started. At the end of my first day at work, Sam and Dave asked me if I would like to come over after work to have a drink or two at the bar and play billiards. I had nothing else to do, so I went. There were three or four other people I went to school with, so it was kind of a mini reunion. After that, I went to the strip once or twice a week. One night, Abe Costico asked me if I did anything on Wednesday nights, and when I told him no, he told me that the mixed league he played in needed backup players. On Wednesday evening, I went to Starlight Lanes and checked in. I filled in for him for about two months, and then one of the guys from the Wilson Jewelers team was transferred out of state, and I was asked to take his place. The team consisted of Joe and Mary Moore, Phil and Sandy Barnes, and me. I went to school with Joe and Mary, even though her last name was Osterman back then. Phil and Sandy moved to the city after I went on my world tour. I was amazed at the change that had taken place in Mary. When we were at school, she was withdrawn and even a little timid. Now she was loud and outgoing and there was something bawdy about her. She always asked me about my personal life, which, unfortunately, did not exist. I've dated some, but none of my dates have gotten to the point where beautiful behavior was supposed to happen. Mary kept laughing and telling me that if I wanted to raise my GPA, 158 if anyone cares, then I needed to make love more often. I looked at Joe, and he just shrugged his shoulders, as if to say, hey, it's Mary. That's how she is. What can I say? One evening, when I went to the strip after working with Sam and Dave, I saw Joe there, who was hitting eight balls with Arnie Miller. When Joe lost Sam, Sam was the next one to take on Arnie, and Joe came and sat next to me. While we were finishing our beer, curiosity got the better of me, and I asked Joe about the changes in Mary. How did she manage to lose so much weight compared to what she used to be? I married her. Are you that strong of a wizard? No, but after marrying me, she broke away from her family. Her father was a violent drunk, and her mother was just a run-of-the-mill drunk with no spine, and she didn't keep dad from abusing children. I got her out of that house, and she blossomed. Bowling ended, and I signed up for the Summer Men's Home League, and returned to the Mixed League in the fall as a member of Wilson's team. Three weeks into the fall season, Joe and Mary showed up with a very beautiful young girl, and I was introduced to Mary's younger sister Katie. I'm trying to get her to go bowling. Mary said, and I brought her here tonight to watch. It was a good evening for us. We took the first and third games and the total number of pins, and when we were putting away our balls and shoes, Mary told me she was going to teach Katie how to bowl starting next Saturday and asked me if I wanted to join them. I said I would like to, and to shorten the story a bit, I asked Katie out, and even though I was six years older than her, she agreed. Six months later, she said yes again when I proposed to her, and three months later we got married. Katie was a virgin when we got married, but luckily I wasn't. One day at work, I was asked to report to Jason Riley's office. Jason was the delivery and reception manager, and while I was sitting there waiting to be let into his office, I was going over in my head everything I could do to get called to the carpet. It turned out that there was nothing wrong with that. XYZ acquired a program that was remarkably similar to the one the Army used to control stocks and track purchases. 
As far as I remember from your initial interview, you were well aware of the use of the army system, and although what we just acquired is not exactly the same system, we were told that it was developed based on the army system. How would you feel about moving out of the warehouse? Just like that, I got a significant promotion and a title. I was the head of the inventory control department. I got a huge load of shit from Sam and Dave, who accused me of being a jerk, but I could tell it was good-natured. Katie wanted to wait a bit before having children, but she didn't want to stay at home all day and watch soap operas until I got home from work, so she got a job as a waitress at a town and country restaurant. The next five years were quite successful both at work and at home. Shortly after our fifth wedding anniversary, Katie began to lose interest in making love. She never said no to me, but she never initiated it again. The days when she would wait for me at the front door in her high-heeled shoes were long gone, but Katie usually came to pick me up a couple of times a week, but that didn't happen anymore. I was racking my brain trying to figure out the reason for the change when Katie finally told me. We had just finished dinner, and Katie said, I want a divorce, Frank. Divorce? Why in the name of all that's holy do you want to get a divorce? What have I done? That's not what you did, Frank. I just don't love you anymore, and I'm sorry to say this, but I don't know if I've ever loved you. I really like you, but I think I only married you to run away from home, away from my father and mother. I sat and looked at her and remembered what Joe had said about Mary running away from her parents. Then the unspoken came to my mind. Are you really saying that you've found someone else that you think you really love? She looked away from me and I asked, How long has this been going on? It doesn't matter, Frank. It's important to me, Katie. How long have you been cheating on me? How long have you been stabbing me in the back? And who is this asshole? And don't try to tell me he's not an asshole. Men who prey on married women are assholes. Don't complicate the situation any more than necessary to be honest. I don't love you and I want to leave. I could have just moved out while you were at work and asked for your service, but I wanted to be honest and tell you about it face to face. Bullshit, Katie. If you wanted to be honest, you would have told me that before you started using that asshole. Do you want to get a divorce? Perfectly. Go get a divorce. But now that I know what a cheater you are, I want you to get out of the apartment immediately. Right now. Right this minute. I'll pack all your things, and you can come and pick them up tomorrow when I get home from work. Be reasonable, Frank. Where should I go urgently? We can coexist. I don't hate you, Frank. I just don't love you. Get out, Katie. Go and live with that asshole you're using. He won't be in town until next week. You can put up with me for so long. I could, but I won't. Live on the street until he gets home. I don't care if you need to buy a cardboard box and live under the underpass on 12th Street. Just get out now before I physically kick you out. Please, Frank. I am? Out, Katie. Right now. She started crying and saying, Please, Frank. Don't do this. And I got up, took her by the hand and led her to the door. I opened it, pushed her out, and then closed the door and locked it. I went and found her purse, took the apartment key off her keychain, took all the credit cards and ATM cards out of her wallet, and then went, opened the door and threw her purse after her. She stood and begged me to let her back in, and I closed the door in her face. Was I unreasonable? Maybe. But she didn't just walk away from me. She cheated on me, and she was never forgiven for it. I cleaned up the kitchen, and then, after making sure that Katie wasn't waiting outside, I went to the Home Depot to get a new lockable front door handle and a bolt similar to it. Then I hurried home to install them in case Katie had a spare key somewhere. Two hours later, the doorbell rang. I looked through the peephole and saw Mary and Joe standing there. I invited them in, offered them a beer, and then waited for what I knew was going to happen. Mary took a sip of beer and then said, Katie called me and said you kicked her out. It's true? Did she tell you why? So you threw her out after all? Yes, I did. But did she tell you why? Just that you threw her out and she had nowhere to stay. I told Joe and Mary this story, and Mary's face showed anger. For a second, I thought it was me for kicking her sister out, but then she said, that stupid, brainless little fool. I'm sorry, Frank. I came here to fight with you about the way you treated Katie, and now all I want is to wring her neck. Is there any chance that the two of you can handle this? None at all. Firstly, she said she didn't love me and wasn't sure she had ever loved me, so I had nothing to rely on to deal with it, and secondly, she cheated on me with another man. It's something I can't forgive, let alone forget. 
After Joe and Mary left, I finished the three bottles of beer left in the fridge and went to bed. After that, everything went quickly. I didn't wait for Katie to file for divorce. I hired a lawyer and applied. The condition was guilt-free, so I couldn't declare infidelity even if I wanted to, which I did. Everything had to be divided equally, which didn't really matter, since we didn't have anything significant. We hadn't been married long enough for Katie to claim my pension, but I had to pay her $126 a week in alimony for two years or until she remarried. Whichever comes first. What really pissed me off was that I was putting money into a special savings account for a down payment on a house, and I had to give Katie half of that money, even though she never invested a cent of what she earned in it. A week after I kicked her out, she moved in with a guy named Raymond Rydell. Being a somewhat vindictive person, one evening, about a month after I sued Katie, I was waiting outside the city for Katie to return from work. Ray worked during the day at the box factory, so Katie shifted her working hours from daytime to afternoon. Ray finished work at 11.30, and Katie finished at midnight. So Ray would come to the restaurant and drink coffee until Katie finished work. When they got out and went to his car, I came out of the shadows, stood in front of him and said, I owe you, you bastard, and hit him as hard as I could. He was stunned, and I went over and beat him half to death, while Katie was crying and trying to pull me away from him. He was lying in a pile on the ground, and after I kicked him in the balls a couple of times, I bent over him and said, This is the price you pay for courting another man's wife. If you're smart, and I bet you're not, then that's the end of it. You just paid the price for using Katie while she was still married to me. Take a beating. Accept that you deserve them and leave. Call the police, and if I end up in jail, even if it only lasts a night, until I can post bail, I'll come back when I get out and break both your arms. If I go to jail for this, I'll come back and break both your legs. I'm going to jail for the third time, and I'm going to put you in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Don't get me wrong, Ray. I'm as serious as death. I got up, looked at Katie crying and said, Okay, now you can kiss him and he'll feel better. I left and went home. I fully expected the police to show up at my door, and in fact I had already arranged everything so that I could be bailed out, but the cops never came. I think Ray either accepted that he had asked for it, or believed my threats, which, by the way, I was honest with every word. A month after the final divorce, Katie moved out from Ray, and I wondered if she suddenly decided that she didn't love him either and chose another lover to replace him, as it was with me. I wondered, but not enough to try to figure it out. Katie had disappeared from sight, and even Mary had no idea where she might have gone. Three years have passed, and my working life has been wonderful. Jason retired, and I was promoted to his position. My personal life was fine. I dated a lot and slept with some people, but I never found the one special girl to live with. On the first evening of the fall league, Mary came in without Joe. She went to talk to the league secretary, and when she turned into the alleys we were walking through, I asked her where Joe was. Joe's gone. I raised my eyebrows in surprise, and she noticed it and said, I owe you an apology. For what? I asked. For thinking you were an asshole for kicking Katie out. I just couldn't understand how you could so suddenly turn away from someone you've lived with for so long. Now I know how you felt at that time. Did he do it? Yes, he did. And with my best friend. I'm sorry, Mary. Me too. Eleven years have been thrown down the drain. At least you didn't have any children. After bowling, Mary and I went to a bar for a drink, and while we were talking, she said, I do not know if this will cheer you up or make you angry, but last month I heard from Katie. I didn't say anything, and she continued. She's unhappy and she knows it's her own damn fault. Oh? She told me her life hasn't been worth a damn since she lost you. She said it was a case where she didn't realize what she had until it was gone. I shrugged and ordered us more portions. A month later, when we went to the bar for a beer after bowling, she asked, Can you do the girl a favor? I suppose. I need to get out of the house. Do you want to take me out to dinner? I think I can do it. On Saturday, I invited her to dinner, and then she wanted to go to the Black Mushroom for a drink, and then, of course, she wanted to dance, and eventually we closed the place. As I was pulling out of the mushroom parking lot, Mary said, Do you know what would be the perfect end to this evening? What? Guided tour of your bedroom. I didn't say anything, but my face must have said, You can't be serious. I'm nowhere near ready for a serious relationship, Frank. 
but I really, really need to make love. Your wish is my law. Mary and I began a relationship of friends with privileges that lasted for almost six months. Continuing our relationship, Mary mentioned Katie from time to time and told me that Katie asked about me and how I was doing every time she called. She knows she screwed up. You should call her. No, thanks, Mary. I burned myself once, blew twice. Besides, I don't even have her phone number, and I have no idea where she is. I have her number. Thanks, but no, don't. And then one night Mary said that this would be our last time. I feel damn guilty messing with you after I talked to Katie and found out how she feels about you. A month later, her company opened a new office in Dallas, and she moved there as an office manager. I was having lunch with Dave one day, and he asked me if I'd ever been to a threesome. No. Why are you asking? I'm just wondering what it would be like. I once saw a movie where a girl made love to three guys, but it probably doesn't count since they were all pretending. How do you simulate a boner? The guys weren't like that. Why are you asking so much? Are you going to one of them? I would love to, but I don't dare. My wife can read me like an open book. If I had done something like that, she would have noticed a change in me and would have harassed me until I blabbed. I don't think figuring out what a gangbang is like would be worth ruining my marriage over. You're lonely. You could have done it. I wouldn't know how to find out where she might be. My friend arranges this for his girlfriend, who wants to celebrate her birthday with a threesome. If you're interested, I could tell my friend about it. Is it okay if I give him your number? I thought about it for maybe a second or two before telling him to keep going. Two days later, Dave's friend, Norm, called me. He asked me if I was really interested in joining him. I asked if he could tell me a little more about it. There's not much to tell. She wants to throw a party for her birthday, which will be next Thursday. We'll do it at my place. She wants five guys. It's not that easy. Dave vouches for you, but she was very specific about choosing the guy she wants. I need you to email me a couple of photos. She won't see the photos and won't have the slightest idea what the guys look like until the evening of the party. I will also need a certificate from the clinic or from a doctor confirming that you are free from prohibited substances and diseases. I did what he wanted, and two days later they called me and told me that I was accepted. Funny thing, you're almost exactly what she described as desirable. He gave me his address and said the party would start at 7. I had something planned for the day of the party, so I told him I'd be half an hour late. One more thing, he said. It's her birthday, and we're going to have a cake. Bring her some birthday present. She doesn't know about this part, so it will be a surprise. I got there at 7.20 and rang the doorbell. A naked man opened the door, introduced himself as Norm, and then asked to follow him to the basement where the party was taking place. We were almost at the bottom of the stairs leading to the basement when I heard. Good. Who wants to go next? I stopped dead in my tracks, completely stunned. I grabbed Norm's arm, stopping him. Lowering my voice, I said, I have a problem here. What? I recognized that voice when she asked who was next. This is my ex-wife, Katie. My problem is that I don't want to ruin your party, but I don't want to miss this chance either. Now that I know it's Katie, I want it more than ever. I'm just afraid that when I go in there and she sees me, she'll freak out and it'll ruin everyone. He looked at me for a few seconds and then asked, did you love her? Yes, it was. Do you see the flashing light above my head? What? It just dawned on me why she was so specific about the type of man she wanted to see here and why you fit that description perfectly. She hasn't forgotten you. That's bullshit. We've been divorced for more than four years now and I haven't seen her for more than three. Then explain to me why the men she wanted to see here had to look like you? I can't. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put her on all fours facing away from the stairs. You walk into a room, stand behind her, and then pat her ass, which she would never let you do. I bet when she sees it's you, she'll go crazy, but not to the point of insanity. I bet she won't leave you alone while you're here. I don't think you're going to ruin the party at all. I think you're going to arrange a gift for her. Give me five minutes. I gave him six and went. I went down to the basement. Katie's head was in Norm's lap. No. Stop it. She screamed. You can't stop. Don't you fucking stop. I'm sorry. Katie surprised me and probably everyone else in that basement. Hey dude, one of the guys said. She must really want what you have. I noticed that Norm was smiling and there was an 
I told you so, expression on his face. All I could do was shrug my shoulders. She looked over her shoulder at me and said, Please, no, no, please don't stop. You are welcome. Don't leave me, please. Don't leave me, she cried. I'm not going anywhere, I said, and it wasn't like that. I watched Norm and three other guys team up with Katie two and three times, and all the while Katie kept her eyes on me. I was sitting on a chair and watching three guys using it. I want her. Consider it done, he said, stepping out of her and pulling her away from me. Katie started protesting until she saw where it was going. I got down on the floor and pulled her to me. Love me, Frank. Love me, please. Love me. I was there too. Participated in my ex-wife's triple party. It was an incredible impulse. She left me because she didn't love me. Norm came over and said, when you guys are done, we'll take a break for cake and ice cream. As before, she clung to me and tried to keep me from getting up, but I managed to break free. Norm helped her up and led her upstairs. I looked for my clothes, and when they moved away from me, Katie looked over her shoulder to see if I was following her, and when she saw that I wasn't there, she tried to break away from Norm and come back. Not wanting to spoil the party, I followed. When we entered the room at the top of the stairs, the guys started singing, Happy Birthday, and Norm led Katie to a table where there was a cake with several lighted candles. Katie blew out the candles and cut the cake. As she sliced, she looked at me and then put the first piece on a paper plate and brought it to me. She looked into my eyes as she held out the plate, and when I took it, she bent her head and kissed my hand. She came back, finished cutting the cake and handed out the pieces, but she didn't kiss anyone else's hand. As soon as the cake was handed out, she chatted with the others, all the while keeping her eyes on me. Let's talk about the weird stuff. Five naked guys and one naked woman are standing around eating a birthday cake. Can you imagine that? Norm said it was time to open the presents and sat Katie down on a chair and we stood in front of her in a semicircle. One guy gave her a set of panties and a bra from Victoria's Secret and the other gave her a bottle of some expensive perfume. Norm gave her a whole day of special treatments at the spa and the fourth guy gave her a gift certificate to the most expensive restaurant in the city. When it was my turn, I was embarrassed because what I gave her was completely out of line with what others gave her. I almost reached for my wallet to get a hundred dollar bill and give it to her, but of course I couldn't really do that. I swallowed it and said, I thought for a long time about what to give to a woman I didn't even know, and finally decided that maybe what I needed was something appropriate for my birthday, as well as what kind of birthday party it was. I handed Katie a gift wrap and she opened it. She looked at me and then back at what was in the box and said, It's perfect. It's just perfect. She got up, came up to me and said, Put this on me. I took a silver chain with a silver pendant with the number 5 hanging from it and put it around her neck. Now it's different, she said, returning to her chair and sitting down. She lifted her right leg and stretched it out in front of her, and I knelt down took a silver ankle bracelet out of the box and put it on her. The bracelet had five small key chains and five letters hanging from it. I don't think the party's over yet. To be honest, I didn't think I could do it again. But Katie proved me wrong, even if it took her ten minutes to do it. Where do you want to put it? Where do you want to get it? Where I can hold on to it forever? I didn't say anything, and she looked away. My ass, baby. I want you in my ass. When I finally got down, I doubt that anything but dust came out of it. When I came out, she screamed. Don't leave me, baby. Please don't leave me. I moved away from her, and two guys came closer, and one took her. Norm came over, stood next to me and watched. After a while, he said, I'm going to miss her. Miss her? After tonight, I doubt she'll want to stay with me. Is she your wife or girlfriend? No. She lives with me. Something like, friends with privileges. Are you kicking her out because of what she's doing tonight? No, of course not. She's never done anything like this before, and I sincerely doubt she'll ever do it again. It was a fantasy that she wanted to bring to life. She's just not the type who wants to do it more than once. So why will you miss her? You really don't know? Do you really not know? I'm afraid not. She's yours, Frank. Everyone here tonight knows that. From the moment she saw you, Everyone else ceased to exist for her. She knew that we were here on the physical plane, but mentally there was no one here but you. Bullshit. 
This is the woman who looked me straight in the eye and said she didn't love me and wasn't sure she'd ever really loved me and then left me for another man. I don't know anything about it, but I do know that when she told me what type of man she would like to see here tonight, she described you. And I also know that she hasn't been able to take her eyes off you since you showed up here. Look at her, Frank. Ben uses her, but she's not looking at him. She's looking at you here. It was true. She was looking at me, and I had already noticed that she often looked at me during the evening. I don't think that means anything, Norm. I think she's just worried that I'm here. She's probably worried that I'll tell all her family and friends about what she's doing tonight. No way. I know her pretty well, and I can read her mind. She belongs to you, Frank. Whether you realize it or not, she's yours. I knew it was bullshit. I still remember the night she said, I just don't love you anymore, and I'm sorry to say this, but I don't know if I've ever loved you. No, she was just worried about what I might say and to whom. The party started to disperse around too. I got dressed, but before I could leave, Norm grabbed me and asked me to help him clean up the apartment a little. The others left before I could ask them, and I don't think Katie should clean up after her own party. I helped him clean up, and then he said he had something he wanted to show me in the basement. I followed him downstairs and asked him what he wanted me to look at. Nothing really. Katie asked me to hold you until she gets dressed. For what? I've already told you. I just shook my head and went back up the stairs. When I entered the kitchen, Katie was standing there. Can I come home with you? You are welcome. I stood staring at her, not knowing what to say. Please, Frank. Please? Norm came up behind me and said, Do it, dude. What have you got to lose? Katie stood and looked at me hopefully. Don't ask me why, because I honestly don't know, but I said, okay. In the car, Katie slid next to me and rested her head on my shoulder, but she didn't say a word the whole trip. I was silent because I was busy asking myself if I understood what the fuck I was doing. When we got to my house, she followed me inside and went straight to the bedroom. When I got there, she was already naked on the bed. I'm sorry, but I don't have anything left. I don't care. What I want is to be hugged. Please, Frank. Give me a hug? What the hell? I thought, a dollar for a dime. I climbed on the bed, hugged her, and we fell asleep. When Katie saw that I was awake, she moved closer to me. She looked me straight in the eye when she said, Could you get used to it? I looked up at her and wondered what the hell was going on with her. First, the way she behaved last night. The desire to go home with me, and now the question. Could you get used to it? She read my expression and said, Tell me, baby, would you like your every morning to start like this? That's a stupid question, I thought. What man wouldn't like to start his day like that? She was hugging me to her, and she must have been getting closer too, because she quickened her pace. She hugged me so that I couldn't pull away, looked into my eyes and asked in a plaintive voice, Can I stay? Do you want to stay? Why in the name of all that's holy do you want to stay? As I recall, Katie, you couldn't wait to get out of here. And that was the biggest mistake of my life. I do not know what to say, Katie, but anyway, I have to go to work now. And I pulled away from her and stood up. She was still lying on the bed when I got out of the shower, and when I started getting socks and underwear out of the dresser, she said, Can I stay and at least talk to you when you get home tonight? I remembered everything Mary had said and what Norm had said to me at the threesome, and curiosity got the better of me. So I told her she could stay until then, and then I went to work and spent the day wondering why the hell I said yes. When I got home, I was surprised to find that Katie had cooked dinner and was waiting for me. She even had a chilled bottle of Merlot ready to pour. We watched each other while we ate, and then I couldn't hold back anymore. I put down my fork and said, What's going on here, Katie? What are you doing? I want to go home, Frank. This is not your home, Katie, and it hasn't been for years. In my mind, this has always been my home. It's just a house that I couldn't go back to because I let myself be stupid. I don't understand, Katie. Less than two weeks after I left here, I realized that I had screwed up. I didn't leave because I didn't love you, but because I thought you didn't love me. Why the hell would you think that? One night I overheard Mary and Joe talking about how they wanted to take me away from my parents, and I heard Joe tell Mary that they could probably trick you into doing it. Joe told Mary that you're one of those jerks who can be relied on to save puppies and little kittens. He told her that all she had to do was get us together, tell you how lousy things were at home, 
and you be soft-hearted enough to do the rest. They invited us to the bowling alley, and you did exactly what Joe said. Did you really think that I would marry you, even if I didn't love you, just to save you? You did it. You did exactly what Joe said. I was a puppy at that moment. I loved being married to you. But after a while, I started feeling guilty for tying you to someone you were with just because you saw the need to save her. When Ray came for me, I thought he really cared about me and I liked him, but I didn't love him the way I loved you. But he seemed to love me, so I went with him so you could get rid of me. I don't believe it. Why didn't you tell me that instead of telling me that you don't love me and want to get a divorce? I wanted to do it quickly to start recovering from the pain. The fact that you didn't talk to me ruined my life, Katie. I don't fucking understand why you think I don't love you. The only true part of your story is that Joe and Mary took you bowling. Mary has never told me about your life at home with your parents. I married you, Katie, because I loved you, not because I was saving puppies or kittens. You tore my heart out when you told me that not only did you not love me, but you didn't think you ever loved me. You ripped out my heart and threw it on the ground, and then drove a stake into it when you let me know that you had already cheated on me with Ray. It wasn't true. I haven't done anything with Ray yet. I only let you think that so that you wouldn't resist me. Ray was a mistake too. All he wanted to do was use me. By the time I realized that and realized how stupid I was to leave you, it was too late to try to come back. I've spent five years trying to find what I had with you, and I've never even come close to it. I saw you from time to time and I was torn apart. I even left so I wouldn't see you anymore. She was silent for a while, and then she said, I'm begging you to bring me back, Frank. I don't think so, Katie. I loved you, and to tell you the truth, I probably never really got over you. But the woman I loved and missed is not the woman I saw last night. I'm not really the woman you saw last night. It was my first time in my life, and except for your role in it, I didn't really like it. Then why did you do it? Because I've never done it, and I was curious. I have two friends who have done it, and they both told me that it was the best lovemaking of their lives, and that I owe it to myself to try it. Norm thought I might like it too, and I let him talk me into it. I told him to arrange it for my birthday. Would it matter if I wasn't there? Did it change for you when you saw that I could see what you were doing? Would you like it more if I wasn't there? No. I already had four guys before you showed up there. A couple of them twice. And I already felt like a piece of meat that was just being used. I got there at 20 past 7. And the party didn't start until 7. How did you manage to do so much so quickly? The party started at 6. When Joe and Ben got there early. Al showed up at 6.45. And by 7 I had everything ready. Why did Norm decide that you would like to drive a train? I had a few triplets with Norm, and I like them. Triplets? Two guys and a girl once and two girls with one guy twice. And you didn't feel like a piece of meat? No, because Norm always made sure that I got what I needed from it. What's going on with Norm? I asked. Not so much. We live together, and he keeps asking me to marry him, but I don't love him. So I always say no. I really like him. I really like him, but a loveless marriage won't last long, and I know it. I had what I needed, and I threw it away. Now I'm asking if there's any way I can get it back. I don't think so, Katie. Too much water has flowed away. She finished her wine, got up and left the table. A minute later, with her purse in her hand, she went out the front door. It wasn't until five minutes later that I realized she didn't have a car. She was driving with me from Norm's house. I grabbed my keys and went to give her a ride, but she was nowhere to be seen. I drove around looking for her, but she disappeared. The next day, when I was washing the dishes after dinner, the doorbell rang, and when I went to the door, I saw Norm standing there. I invited him in, pointed to the couch, and went to get two bottles of beer from the refrigerator. I gave him one, sat down on the chair opposite him and waited. He took a sip of his drink and then asked, Have you ever been in love? Once. What happened? You know the answer to this question. You were at her birthday party. How long did it take you to come to your senses? I've never tried it. And yet you don't give her a chance. Too much has been left behind. Like what? The way she left. What has happened since then? By happened since then, are you talking about her bed life? I shrugged my shoulders. You didn't have a piece of ass anymore after she left? I glared at him. But before I could say anything, he said, so she was trying to find someone else, but then so were you. Am I right? 
Or is it a more recent event? How about the night before last? Why were you there, Frank? It was because you were curious and wanted to see what it was like. Considering that, how can you blame her for doing the same thing? All she did was satisfy the curiosity that Bev and Darla aroused in her. I don't know if you liked it or not, but she didn't like it. When she came home last night, I asked her if she wanted to do it again, and she replied, not in this life. But I'm not here to talk about her birthday. I asked Katie to marry me five times, and she always said no. She says she can't marry me because she doesn't love me. She says that she has loved only one man in her life. And she foolishly let him go, and he will not take her back. Why the hell not, Frank? You still love her. I could tell by the way you looked at her at the party. She made no secret of the fact that she loves you. I have to tell you, Frank, it kills me to be here talking to you. I'm trying to persuade you to give her a chance. I want her so much that it hurts, but she doesn't want me. She wants you. I care about her, Frank. I care about her so much that I want to see her happy. Give her a chance, Frank. Here's her cell phone number. Call her. What do you have to lose? Thanks for the beer. And he got up and left. Finishing my beer, I stared at the door. I thought about what he said for a while, and then I got up and finished cleaning the kitchen. I didn't think about anything else for the next two days. I thought about Katie and what she said, and I thought about what Norm said. I remembered what Mary had said. I thought back to the life I had before the day Katie left, and thought about the life I've led since then. The only thing that kept coming back to me was what Norm said. Give her a chance, Frank. What do you have to lose? I took the piece of paper Norm had given me, with Katie's cell phone number, and stared at it for maybe a minute, and then reached for the phone. End.